Welcome everyone to another episode of Slasher Scotty. I am your host, Scotty McCoy, and I have an alumni from Friday the 13th, Part 4, the final chapter. I have uh, Eric Anderson, and he played uh, Rob Dyer in Friday the 13th, Part 4. Hey, Eric, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Scotty? I'm doing great, doing great. It's uh, been a long day, but uh, it's, what a way to end it. It's going to be a great way to end it. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, so the first, uh, yeah, yep. good. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. The first way to, uh, the first question I have for you is not related to Friday the 13th, but it's how did you get your start into acting? Uh, you know, I started as a, I was probably in some elementary school productions. I think I played Benjamin Franklin in something, but, uh, I actually was a high school. I acted in high school and was, um, you know, I did all the theater stuff and in high school in the era that I went to high school, we had a fully decked out theater and, and it was a, at a public school in California. And, and, uh, you know, we took our, took things very seriously. We entered a lot of competitions and, uh, we did really well in those competitions. I, one year, um, I, I, I have a, some trophy, I think back in some closet somewhere where I won a best supporting actor role in some countywide competition, and uh, the actress that year who won that same award was Annette Benning. So that was uh, that was pretty funny. I grew up in uh, <laughs> southern, southern San Diego County, uh, a town called Chula Vista, which is right on the Mexican border. And so then I uh, decided that uh, there wasn't much of a future in that, um, just because it seemed, you know, I was down there in Chula Vista. I was I didn't know anything or anybody or any of that stuff. And so I went to college. And uh, at University of California, Santa Barbara, I got a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. I went to go work at uh, USC School of Medicine in the Department of Virology for a while. And um, I kept thinking, boy, I hate this. I hate everything about my life. I, I really wanted to get back to the thing that I love. But it took me a while. It took me about uh, two years. I uh, worked, uh, went to work at Hughes Aircraft and worked on the, the laser rangefinder for the, uh, the M1A1 tank. Um, I went to work after that at Northrop Grumman and worked on the stealth technology that became the stealth bomber. And then I went to work at uh, Magnavox Government Electronics and was part of the original GPS team there. And then in 1980, Congress voted zero funding to GPS. And I found that a great opportunity to have them lay me off. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was already up in L.A. taking acting classes and kind of fumbling around. I really didn't know what I was doing. I was taking classes that I read about, like in a magazine or something like that. And they were the worst classes you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And then I eventually someone clued me into a good teacher. I went to that teacher, and, and then I eventually I, I quit this job at Magnavox. I got a job waiting tables at a restaurant here in Los Angeles. Then uh, I met some other people, and then I that acting class, some of those people started to get work. And then uh, suddenly there I was one day auditioning for a play on Melrose Avenue, actually. Um, and I... I um, played a, uh, a character in a play called Creeps, where I played a man with terrible policy. And from that moment, uh, I had agents and managers asking to represent me. And after that, it was a very short period of time I started uh, working professionally. And uh, my first feature that was ever released was Friday the 13th, Part 4. That's I awesome. did two other movies before that, but neither one of them ever got released. That's awesome. That's and awesome. I, and I was doing a television series at the time that I was doing Friday the 13th Part 4, where I played an over-the-hill baseball pitcher, and um, I had a mustache. And so when I went into audition for it, Friday the 13th Part 4, Joe Zito, I had the mustache, and Joe Zito says, well, would you shave that? And I said, yeah. So I shaved it for the for that movie, and then I, when I went back into the TV series, I had to put a fake one on me. It looked really bad. It looked horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's really what it was and then since then you know it was there was there was a little more fits and starts i suppose at the very beginning and then it became i became a very consistent professional journeyman actor i've done 300 episodes of television and now 25 some 30 movies and and i've done 
maybe 50 stage productions and and uh and that's just i'm that guy i'm the guy that you that everyone that i run into that recognizes me in some way goes did i did i go to high school with you <laughs> they, they don't know what it's from you know but right. they they that that's that's where the recognition comes from except for the star trek people because i did one episode of the next generation mm-hmm. and uh those people know me my character the episode number that i did and uh <laughs> most of my most, most of my dialogue as well yeah they're, they're hard, diehard fans <laughs> yeah so what was your audition like for fred of the 13th part four it's a really good question so i um Between you and me, Scotty, I, I was not, I was, uh, I'm a bit of a snob. I, I still am to this day. And um, in retrospect, I'm glad that I wasn't. But at the time, I was like, when my agent called and said, I have an audition for you and it's for this movie, um, they're not calling it Friday the 13th Part 4 because of a lot of reasons. But uh, are you interested? I said, no that's not something I would ever do. That's crazy. And they said, no, no, come on. Kevin Bacon did it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and some of the other people that I knew through the time, they, everyone does these things. You, you, you're going to want to do this. And I said, Oh, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's for me. And he said, no, no, you should really go to this. And I said, okay, whatever. But they wouldn't give me the script. They only gave me a couple of scenes. And I came in and I uh, had a friend actually outside in the car waiting for me because we were flying to San Francisco to see the Giants play the Padres that weekend. Mm-hmm. It was a weekend series. It was a Friday afternoon. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I went to this building over on Wilshire and uh, La Brea, the old Samsung building, and uh, went into the audition and, you know, just did whatever, whatever it was that was that I was supposed to do. And suddenly it was oh my God, will you shave your mustache? And I'm like, yeah. And, and I, I really had no clue that, that, that I'd done anything that was right or good or anything for whatever, for whatever reason, Joe Zito decided in that moment that I was his guy and I had no idea. I finished the audition, I got in the car, I flew to San Francisco, I had a great weekend with some bunch of buddies that I went to college with and went to baseball games. And when I came back the following Monday, they said, hey, they're really interested in you in this. And I went, oh. No, this is not good. I don't, I don't really <laughs> want to do this. And, and then uh, they eventually uh, made the offer, and I said, "Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it." And um, you know, it, it, when you do one of these movies, it's for scale, right. and uh, it's not like it's a big payday or anything like that. It's just you know, you make whatever the lowest price. It's the lowest price thing that SAG has, basically, except mm-hmm. for a regular feature film at the time. This was in 1983, so, and um, and that was, and I and I accepted it and ended up doing it. And he's a casting director, who I, Fern Champion and, and, and Pamela Basker, who I, I got to know much better as years as the years went by. They said, you know, we saw 300 guys for this thing, and I said, Dude, how did you pick me? I, I really was like, I was completely confused as, as to why they chose me. I really am. To this day. It's so, so, that's all. Nice. That, that, that was the audition story. Yeah. Nice. So before we uh, actually went live, uh, you said you had a Tom uh, Savini story. Do you want to tell us what that story was? Oh, just that I ran into Savini at a convention in, 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 in uh, Dallas, I guess. And I was, uh, I think it was called Frightmare. And I was sitting across from him. He didn't remember that I had been in the movie. He, 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 but I reminded him, and and uh, I was the only guy. Well, Kim and I, and Corey, and I guess Ted were the only people that were on the movie for the entire shoot. Mm-hmm. The rest of the people that were part of the movie were once they were killed, they were off the picture, and it was that was it. They didn't mm-hmm. need them anymore. So uh, we, this is supposed to be a six week shoot, but it ended up being twelve. And I remember that they, they, they used to call Joe Zito Francis, as in Francis Coppola, <laughs> partly because he saw 300 guys for Rob before he made his decision, and partly because it took him 12 weeks to shoot a six-week movie. <laughs> but I, 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 I will say that I think that of all the ones that I've only seen a couple, I, I think it's 
to get the best production value. I think it has the best. Yeah. There's something about this movie that 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 is better than the other ones. I think, and just in general, it just has the right tone mm-hmm. in some odd way. Yeah. I mean, it's, all that stuff. All that stuff was developed beforehand. That they, you have idiot kids that get killed, and and then um, people cheer and all that stuff. But I I I. I I think this one there was a lot more care taken for some reason. I I, yeah. I, ch- I chopped that to Joe Zito, by the way. Um, I yeah. think he really, he really, he really. I went on to go make uh, Missing in Action with Joe Zito right after that. We went to the Philippines with Chuck Norris, and he had the same thing. He had the same kind of ethic in the way that he went about what okay. he was making these these kind of exploitation films. So. Right, and I think so. This, uh, so anyway, I told it. To, I, I didn't finish the top. So I said to Savini, I said, you know, I'm Eric. You know, I don't know if you remember, but I played Rob in Part Four and stuff like that. He goes, Oh yeah, I remember. And I said, So um, do you remember how I died? He goes, Yeah, we didn't. We ended up not doing what we were going to do with you. And I go, Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And I said, So how you been? He goes, Well, I'm here. And the only reason I he, what he said was the only reason I came back to do Part Four was that Jason was dead in part one. And so when they offered me to come back and do part four, it was because I was going to kill him for real. I was going to kill him in any, there would be no doubt that he was not alive after (laughs) this movie. And that's what, if you look at that, the, 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 that final scene there, that's, he's dead. Right. (laughs) Yeah. He's not, he's not coming back to that. Exactly, exactly. So what was your uh, actual death scene supposed to be? Um, you know, it was, they had the, all the appliances. He had, Tom had all these appliances with um, these three-pronged gardening harrows with blood shooting out of them mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And, and there were supposed to be close-ups of me being my, the script says, flesh being ripped away from my face. And, hmm. and, it, and, and Joe just decided that it was going to be a much longer sequence than normal, right. than the normal deaths, in fact, and, and that it was going to be more psychological than it was going to be physical. Right. He wanted a psychological turn. He wanted to remove me from the movie mm-hmm. or from the story. Right at the point where the only two people that would be left would be Trish and Tommy. Right. And, uh, and um, that's what I mean about Joe. I mean, Joe had a very, and I'm sure that Barney Cohen, who wrote the script, that they, that they talked about it, I don't know if the Barney Cohen ever existed, by the way. <laughs> I always questioned, I never met him, and I always questioned Joe. I said, you know, right here, I feel like there's something should be different here. And he said, let me talk to Barney. And, <laughs> and then he would come back to me and he would say, yeah, Barney says that's okay, we can do that. And I was <laughs> like, okay, great. And I go, can I talk to Barney? He goes, no. no. And I said, there is no Barney, right? He goes, no, no, there's the Barney. So I don't know if that's really true or not. <laughs> It's funny because uh, one of my uh, like I I have on my YouTube page I have like all of the Friday the Thirteenth death scenes and I have them like clipped up like they're all individual you know videos and by far your death scene is the one that has the most likes it has over I believe I think it's over like seventy five thousand or hundred thousand views and it has like over I believe like three thousand comments and I get new comments daily. But you know. But I think a lot of that is people like thinking it's the stupidest thing of all time. They 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 always say that they laugh at like laugh at how you're just yelling at it like he's killing me he's killing me and everybody's like I think he's killing him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that's what and when I get, you know when I run into somebody who's a fan of the movie or I'm at one of these conventions that I've been at over the years, it, you know I I think they think it's it's stupid, but you know the. You, I'm sure, Scotty, you might know the the why I said that line. Yes, that was that was, yeah. So, uh, if you think about it in from in those terms, um, it, it it is kind of uh, um, it's very harrowing. It's very haunting that yes. that somebody would be saying that if they're done. Yes, you know? I agree. And yeah, I, but to other people, it's like, oh yeah, well, of course he's killing you. That's I'm watching it. You're commenting about on what I'm watching. 
So. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really not about the effect of, and about the blood and the gore and the gruesomeness of how he's killing you. It's the psychological fear and terror of this maniac that is killing all these people that you just saw murder them in cold blood is literally killing somebody, and he's yelling out in distinct fear and terror that he's dying right now. Yes. He's, exactly, that he's dying in that moment. Yes. You so, know, I, I think I, I, I've said this in multiple uh, 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 venues and arenas, but right before we went to go shoot this picture, we were uh, we went up and shot all the lake scenes, not all the lake scenes, but a lot of the lake scenes, like the skinny dipping scenes mm-hmm. and all that stuff, was shot at a private lake up in uh, Santa Barbara County called uh, Zaka Lake. Right. It's just a... It's just a big hole in the ground. It, it's a little, I don't know, it's a lake. And um, we stayed at the Anderson's Pea Soup House uh, Hotel in Buellton. And um, before we shot, Joe Zito came to my room and he says, do you know anything about these movies? And I said, no, I don't. He goes, well, let me tell you what happens in these things is that there's there's a kind of this kind of ridiculous behavior from these stupid kids, and as they get killed one by one, people cheer when they go to the movies. <laughs> Our goal, Eric, and I want uh, we can discuss this as we do this, but our goal is for them not to cheer when you die. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, I can. Do, we that's something that I can can understand, you know. Uh, and it was a really great note. It was one of my, one of my favorite notes from a director of all time, which is we have this goal to try to produce this character that we're not he, we don't want him to die, right? In some way, I'm sure there's people out there that were really happy that I was dead. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a wonderful world. But the right. bottom line is that I, I I that was my goal as I went into the thing. So yeah. And um, anyway, go ahead. You have another question. I, I have. I have. Uh, I'm going to get to two other pieces of business that that I, I will tell you, which 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 uh, will move. On, uh, will be part of that theme that we just spoke about. But go ahead. Okay. Awesome. No problem. Uh, what was it like working with Ted White? You know, I have to tell you that I I've spent a lot of time in this business with professionals. And, and there are certain guys along the path that were that guy, you know, the mm-hmm. guy who was just the pro. Every aspect of the way that he approached this craft was from a professional standpoint. Mm-hmm. And you learn, in my era, you learn this as an actor. You know where to stand. You know where the camera is. You know where the lights are so you don't move to block the light. There's all these things that you learn as part of your craft. And mm-hmm. Ted is the was the epitome of a craftsman. And so I was always in awe of the guy in the sense that he was this guy. In fact, if you look at my career, to a certain degree, what I emulated was Ted White. What I emulated were other actors that I'd worked with that were strictly professional. They showed up, they knew what they had to do. Mm -hmm. There was no indulgence about what it is that they were doing. They had a job to do. There was... 80 people standing around, they weren't going to waste anyone's time. They were going to get the job done. And right. that was Ted White. And and to me, that was, to this day, Ted and I have been in multiple situations 35 years after the fact. You know, we've mm-hmm. been at conventions or we've been, uh, and, and him and I always, whenever I see him, I just get such a, a feeling of, wow, this is why, I, well, this is what it became for me. It became mm-hmm. this kind of, like, I have a chip on my shoulder about the fact that it's about being a professional. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's what Ted is. That's awesome. So what was yeah. your most memorable moment about filming Friday the 13th Part 4? Um, we got a couple. Um, one for sure is, you know, the scene where it's, first of all, we, we shot up at Zaka Lake and we're up there. We started on shooting on, on the day after Halloween. So on mm-hmm. November 1st and we shot up there. I think we were up there for probably about uh, maybe a week, not much longer than that. And then we moved to the Kelly Gulch where they had built the house, mm-hmm. both houses, Kelly, uh, 
Kelly's house was was used as, as as Trish's house, and then they had built the house that the kids were the rental house the kids were in. And we also shot up at a place in 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 the and I I walk my dog at all the time called Upper Franklin Canyon uh, Reservoir, okay. up in uh, just 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 on the other side of Beverly Hills there. And um, but we were in Topanga Canyon, and it was you know December, a little bit of January. It was thirty five degrees, mm-hmm. and every scene. This is. Is a good example, but when I I didn't read the script, obviously I was just given the pages to do the audition, and then I got the movie, and then I, they gave me the script. And when I read the script, I went, "Oh my God!" The last forty scenes this movie takes place at night in the <laughs> rain, <laughs> so they need to have all the rain machines going at the time, and they have to shoot at night. And so to keep continuity, they have to hose you down and make mm-hmm. you wet before each scene. And it's 35 degrees outside. So they had uh, some of the some of the ways that would wet you down is they had these like sprayers, like uh, what you would use if you were going to do some fumigating or something like that. Right. And they, they <laughs> heated the water up and put that in there and try to keep us warm. But Kimberly and I were shivering the entire time because she's in a little dress, right? Right. I'm in, actually have pants and a, and a and a flannel shirt on. But she, I, I felt so bad for her all the time. Oh. And uh, so we're freezing all the time. And um, and so there's a scene where we cross over from the house. It's right before my death, actually. And we cross over from the house to the other house. Mm-hmm. And it's raining. And Gordon, the dog, mm-hmm. is there. And he kept getting in my way. And mm-hmm. l- luckily, they left that. They left that uh, that that take in when he kept getting my way. Cause I love when stuff like that happens. <laughs> and I got to the door, and then we cut. I pull out my little knife out of my boot. We get to the door, and then we cut. And so I, I'm a young actor. I, I I I'm probably not that bright at that point in some ways. But the guy said to me, "Hey, do you want the real knife or the rubber knife for the knife that you have in your boot?" I said, well, I want to feel that the, the, the weight of the real nut. He goes, okay, but just be careful. It's really sharp. So I said, okay, yeah, I can do that. And so we go and we shoot that. We finish it. They go, okay, let's do it again. And I take that knife and put it back in the little scabbard that was in my ankle. And I miss the scabbard and I plunge the knife into my ankle. Ooh. And blood is, is pooling in my boot. It, it, and I don't want to <laughs> tell anyone. Because I, I don't want to, you know, this 80, I'm a pro. I don't want to stop the production and say, hey, I'm going to need stitches here. Right. I'm like, let's go, right? And uh, and so we continued to shoot. I ended up getting four stitches in my ankle. Okay. And uh, and when I took my boot off, I poured out what I looked, seemed like a gallon of blood. It was probably only about, uh, you know, three ounces. But... Um, <laughs> That was a uh, that was that was a memorable moment. Wow. Uh, what were the other memorable moments? The, the being cold throughout the whole thing was was memorable. Um, I lost my voice in the, during the scene when I was being killed, and it's funny because I have a I I, I it's not that funny, but uh, I have mm-hmm. a I, I my voice is trained to be mm-hmm. able to do nights and nights and nights of performances in the theater. Right. And so I uh, can, I get my voice not from my throat. It comes from in my diaphragm. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, when we were shooting that scene, I thought, oh, no, this guy's not a trained actor. This is a guy who's revenging the deaths of his sister. <laughs> I go, I can't use that voice. I have to use a different voice. And I did. And then we did one take of that scene. Mm-hmm. And in that one take, uh, that was what you see at that first take. And the second take I could never have done because I had no voice after that first take. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> it seems like like very uh very fun time though. Like even though like of all those things, like I always wanted to be like in a Friday the Thirteenth movie and all that. And that seems like it just seems like a dream job. Well, it, if you if you if it was you, Scotty, yep. and you were and you are a fan and all that stuff, or even Corey, Corey, Corey knew all about this stuff. And I would always <laughs> ask him, 
what what's supposed to be going on here half the time with Corey because he knew all about he was a big fan I was not right. and I didn't know anything about it when I went into it I was taking it from a kind of a I was understanding the entire concept but I was taking it from what Joe and I were talking about and everything along those lines so when you say that in that way I, 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 I'm not, I, I, I was not aware of that. It was a job and I was doing this job. Right. I, one thing I did notice that I was soaking wet after each night that we wrap, which is usually about five or six in the morning. Right. And, uh, and I would, I had a big old air force parka that was, that they had given me. I think I still have it somewhere here. <laughs> and I would just, instead of like, uh, I always put that on. I would take my clothes off, my wet clothes off, and give it to the thing and put whatever I had come to work in and then put this Air Force park on, but I wouldn't have them remove my makeup because that could take an hour. Yes. And I was freezing. <laughs> and so when after I was killed, and then there was this whole week of Jason being killed on the, on the floor of the of the of Trisha's and Tommy's house. Right. And and my body being thrown through the window and all that stuff. But once they established where I was on the floor, I had to come into work for an entire week, get hosed down, have pieces of glass embedded in my face along with the wounds from my death, and then just lay on the floor as a dead person. <laughs> and so when those days were over, I would just basically... Like I said, take the clothes off and put my parka on. Right. Get in my Volkswagen, 65 Volkswagen Bug, <laughs> and and drive home. And uh, I got pulled over for, I don't know, my taillight out or speeding. or I don't know, I think I, you can speed in one of those cars unless you're going downhill. But uh, <laughs> And the guy, the cop came around the corner and saw me with my face ripped up and blood everywhere and, and everything. And he goes, are you, Oh, you know, he freaked out. He, he didn't know. And I explained to him that I was shooting a horror film up in Topanga Canyon and I was freezing and I, and he goes, Oh, you, you gotta go home. You gotta get out of here. So he let me go. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh my God. I'm trying, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, that was really memorable about, uh, those moments it it was an odd thing it became it was really was my job the other thing was you know often uh kimberly and i would just ride out to work together so Mm -hmm. she would pick me up because we knew we'd be there all the time especially toward the end of the production and it was really fun to hang out with her i really like her i think she's just one of the great people in the world i always thought she was one of the great people in the world nice um, let's see. Uh, so this was more of a kind of a yes or no type question. Uh, I don't know if you know all the semantics that go into it. Um, but, um, I'm assuming the body that was thrown through the window was a dummy. Can you confirm or, den- or deny this? No, no, no. That's a stunt man. That was a stunt man. That, oh, okay. Uh, and that was a very, there was a compli- very complicated stunt. I forget who the guy was, but very complicated stunt. And the distance between, um, the window and the back wall that was a big point of discussion about whether he could. So what they do is they put his, they put his body on what's called an air ram. I think it's called an air ram, okay. which is like a catapult. They put, he stands on a catapult All right. and then they blow that catapult and he flies through the window. that's made of, you know, sugar, spun sugar or whatever <laughs> the f- fake glasses. Yeah. And then they put padding on the other end of the wall because they were afraid that he would be fly at such a, a velocity that he would smash into the other side of the wall. <laughs> so they put mattresses up over there, but it was incumbent upon him to actually hit the window in a straight position and then twist his body so that he didn't hit his head, <laughs> so that he would kind of almost do it a twist and land on his back as he smashed into the back wall. And that was a huge night. Hmm. It's funny because like I said, I was there for every night that they shot because of the, the schedule that I was on. So I got to see that one, nice. the shot of uh, Trish going out the window and landing on the top of the car. That's awesome. That was a very exciting night. That was absolutely incredible. 
Right. And what they did was they had a stunt woman jump out that window and land on the top of that car. She was fully padded. And they had right. water cannons inside the car so that when she landed, the water cannons blew out the glass. That's awesome. Yeah, on the windows. Yeah, no, it, was, it was fun because I'd never been in, in one of those things. I'd never seen that stuff happening. Right. That, that was an yeah. insane scene. Yeah. Let's see. So um, that was that was fun. I got to witness all that stuff, which was awesome. really cool. That was really like part of the when you talk about other memorable moments, they didn't involve me. They involved other people getting <laughs> killed and stuff like that. So, <laughs> and I got to watch all of that stuff. That's awesome. Um what was the best part about filming Friday the thirteenth part four and what was the worst? Um I don't know, just I don't know, just having a job is the best part always <laughs> and the worst part uh was just that it was cold i was cold a lot i was freezing a lot but i you know i again i i like i when i stabbed myself in the ankle i i didn't i didn't i wasn't a complainer so i i just i just felt like uh you know that's 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 the gig this is what i signed up for you know right right i never spent time i never went i never spent time in the military i never did those things so it's right. like this is the this is the rite of passage in some way, you know. Right. And uh, and so that was uh, that part of it was really uh, that was just part of it, just the part of the thing. Right. But what, what I was going to tell you yep. was uh, after it was over, we had a cast and crew screen. Okay. And uh, I asked my mother and. Uh, my stepfather to come up and, and see it was my first movie that was getting released so I said you should come up and see this I'll invite you get your tickets to the cast and crew screening and so we went, went to this theater and it was packed with all the people that were involved in the production it was really incredible uh, to see all these people again after God I guess it wasn't very long. We, we finished shooting probably in January of 1984, and it was released on April 13th, Friday, the April 13th, on mm-hmm. in 1984. Right. And um, but somewhere we're, uh, the week before the uh, the release, we had this cast and crew screening, and I went to it, and I was, I'm watching this movie, and Scotty, you won't agree with me on this, but I'm watching this, saying, "Oh my God, this is this is disgusting. This is <laughs> we're putting this out in the world. This is like." so wrong that this is what is considered entertainment right. and uh, my mother and her, my stepfather were just like they had their hands over their face the entire time and I'm, I'm sure they're thinking what has my son done what, what, what is what's he doing is, this is crazy <laughs> and um, I, I really was disturbed after that screening and I came away from that but then it opened on like I said uh, Friday the 13th April 13th, 1984, and I bought 20 tickets for all my friends at the, the Hollywood, Fox Hollywood Theater, I think it was, at, right. on Hollywood Boulevard for the 8 o'clock show on that Friday night. <laughs> and uh, I had a friend, a couple friends go early and reserve, kind of reserve some seats, and I brought and the idea was we'd all go to the movie and then we would all come back to my apartment and we would have a, some kind of, you know, food and drink and celebrate the first movie that I'd ever been in being released. So we went to the movie and I had 20, pe- 20 people, 20 of my friends went and in the first, but it's and the hockey mask blows up in the beginning. Yep. After you've seen all the deaths, and it's the preamble to the movie actually started. Yep. 14 of those friends are out, up, out, and in the lobby. They're not going to stay. <laughs> and only six, only six of my friends stuck around. Wow. But I, there was a whole thing that was going on in the theater where people were screaming at the, at the screen and they were throwing stuff at the screen and they were laughing when characters died and they were uh uh you know it was running up and down the aisles and i thought oh now i get it this is what this thing is (laughs) this is an event this is a whole thing this is not about the structure of the story or 
all that stuff. This is about having this event with all these uh, 400 people that could fit in this theater. And I've said, I've said this multiple times, but the two things that were really funny were that uh, as I went down into the basement with my little, tiny little knife, the knife that I'd stuck into my ankle uh, mistakenly early, in an earlier, uh, you know, a week or two before I shot the scene where I actually died, <laughs> uh, the girl sitting next to me who has no idea who I am turns to her friend and goes, oh my God, this guy's so stupid, I don't even believe it. <laughs> and then <laughs> subsequently I was killed. And then at the end of the movie, I was walking out of the theater and all my friends that had been in the lobby and all, everyone was guy going, oh, wow, Eric, that was, that was so great in the most sarcastic way you can possibly imagine. <laughs> um, this girl goes, that's the guy, that's the guy. That's the guy in the movie, that guy right there, that's the guy in the movie. <laughs> and the, uh, her friend said, no, 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 the guy in the movie was fat. So... Um, <laughs> That made me feel like a hundred, a million dollars. And so awesome. I walked out of the theater on Hollywood, April thirteenth, nineteen eighty four. That's awesome. So, did you ever see any of the other Fred of the Thirteenth after you were in this one at all? I never saw one that happened before. I never saw the one that happened after. I've never seen one. Really? Um, no, I'm not. I'm not. That's not my thing. I just. Yeah. I, it never. All that stuff is is. Uh, I understand, I, and I run into people that are fans of it all the time, and I'm part of their, you know, I'm part of the lexicon right. of this environment and all that stuff, and I think that's that's awesome. Um, and I can tell you my experience of having had done it on gra- on the ground level, mm-hmm. but I did it as a professional, just like a lot of right. the other people that have been in these things. And yeah. you know, through the years, I. Uh, Amy Steele and I did an episode of uh, Quantum Link together, and I just love her. I think she's just so mm-hmm. awesome, and and so we've run into each other at these at these conventions. Judy and I have become pretty good friends, but you know, thirty years after the fact, you know, that yes. that, that, that and um, you know, ironically, Lawrence Monison and I were in an acting class back in the very early eighties uh, mm-hmm. together, and so we knew each other when we did this movie. That's awesome. So. It, it, yeah, so it was, it was, um, I don't know, it, it just was a time, it was of a time. I, right. I didn't realize, it, and I didn't realize at the time that it was a big deal, and it has become that, Yeah. much more so, you know, in the, God, I mean, it's 37 years, yep. it'll be 37 years in, in October that we started shooting it. That's crazy, and I mean, I, I I'm always more of a fan of the '80s of films of Friday the Thirteenth than the '90s and the recent ones like 2009 and everything. Um, I've always liked, you know, one through I'd say one through seven are my like the ones that I'll, I'll I could always watch. With part four actually yeah. being probably the one I would watch the most because it's just it got amazing character development, and I think it's got amazing storyline to that one. Um, it's just it's just. I don't know. It just got that feel to it. Well, it talks, you know, the, all the all of that goes to Joe Zito. Awesome. All that goes to Joe, who not only approached it with that kind of mentality, mm-hmm. but also when he edited it, what he was trying to achieve that that was important to him. He was right. He was, uh, you know, I think he was probably pretty obstinate in the fact that he was going to get what he wanted out of this thing. Right, and right. it wasn't just a job. It wasn't just a job to him. Yeah. You know? So, what was it like working with Kimberly Beck and Corey Feldman? Well, it was very interesting because Corey was um, he was maybe twelve, I guess, and he had done one other thing, I think, before that. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was he was a great kid, and he had he had his grandfather was his guardian who was there when we were on location. And Kim and I felt bad for him because it was we we actually arrived at the location on mm-hmm. Halloween, so we thought, oh, this would be a great rehearsal. You know, let's just all get to know each other. Let's go trick or treating. Mm-hmm. So we were at this motel, and uh, right just to the west of us was a kind of a subdivision, mm-hmm. and so we asked Corey's grandfather if we could take him trick or treat. We went to this, mm-hmm. the subdivision, and he had a mask on, and mm-hmm. he he had uh, 
he was just an innocent kid at this, this, this time of life. And, uh, you know, right. uh, things change, you know. But um, in that moment when we took him trick-or-treating and w- it was fun. There was, it was, the neighborhood really put on a show for their Halloween, so it was kind of really mm-hmm. awesome. It was almost like being at a Halloween car- carnival within this little subdivision in this neighborhood. Awesome. So it was really, really great. But uh, uh, I, we were, you know, it was just, uh, he was just a kid. He was just a 12 year old kid. And right. He was a fan of the movies and, and uh, excited to be here and to be part of it. <laughs> you know, and that's and that's that was a different time for everybody, I guess. Yeah, it's awesome though. What what was the environment like on set for uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Four? Just you know, it was, we 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 did our thing. There was I don't know if you know the history of the of those, especially those first four movies, but there was a family in, and I don't know if this is right or not. This might be paraphrased from something else, but. There was this family in Boston. I'm not sure if their name was the Barsmans, but it could have been something else. Uh, who owned a, a theater, a, a group of theaters in the, in the in Massachusetts in that area, and they're the ones who put up the money for for these movies, okay. which subsequently Paramount would then buy in what is called the negative pickup situation. Mm-hmm. So the money got put up by these people then Paramount would buy them and then ended up paying them back and then they would have some participation in it and all this stuff. And that whole environment was different because Paramount, it was a non-union crew kind of thing. And so Paramount was could not be legally involved with the production, mm-hmm. except that they were. You know, our producer was Frank Mancuso Jr., whose father ran the studio. Right. So they were there was always that aspect of the fact that this was a Paramount picture, but it was not a Paramount picture okay. until it was a Paramount picture after it was finished. But there was one of the members of the family who put up the money there all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that was, it was, I don't know, it was just this odd kind of, that was this weird thing. It was an independent movie in that way. Right. And stuff, but, but, mm-hmm. Everything was very pro, you know. The only thing that, that was kind of odd was that Joe was... We had a call sheet, but Joe liked to bounce around a little bit. And he liked it. So often people were called to the set, and I, you might not work for three days, but you would be there for the 12 hours. And, oh, wow. and anyway, well, they owned you. We, we were all on, on salary, so they didn't have to call you. They couldn't you know, they could call us in. I read like seven novels during the shooting of this movie <laughs> in my honey wagon uh, with a little space heater for a <laughs> lot of stuff. But whenever, what was great about it was they would call me in when they were throwing Trish out, when Trish jumped out the window. So I got to watch all that, you know? Okay. Nice. And so it was kind of, that was the best part about it awesome. in so many ways. I got to see that stuff up close. That's awesome. So what was uh, Joe Zito like as a director? You know he was he was good. I liked Joey. We, we liked we uh, we liked that he he had this you know this little grin that he'd come up to you and go, "Here's what we we're trying to do here," and and you'd do it. And he would. Oh, he's always very happy. <laughs> I, I like Joe. I, he 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 never. It, I'm sure that he got a tremendous amount of pressure from everyone else that was mm-hmm. part of this production, but in his relationship with the actors, that seemed to be that he had an idea. Now I know Ted and Joe probably didn't get along very well because mm-hmm. Ted, I think thought Joe might've been reckless at times. Yeah. And, uh, there's a, a the famous story about Judy mm-hmm. turning blue out in the water. Yeah. And that, uh, Ted saved Judy in that moment and all that stuff. But for me and my, what I had to do with Joe, I, I, I and we got along well enough that, you know, we went on and did another movie after that, and I think we would have done more, except mm-hmm. that uh, the circumstances didn't allow it. You know, part of the reason why <laughs> I went to go do Michigan Action in the Philippines with Joe and Chuck Norris and uh, and uh, Emmett Walsh, which was, was awesome, and 
I got out in the middle of the jungle in Pang San Han in the middle of, uh, of Luzon in the Philippines with Chuck Norris and I'm six feet tall I'm a little over six feet tall and he's like five four five five mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's not a tall guy so suddenly I was standing all the way across the jungle from him we never had any scenes where we were next to each other <laughs> and uh, Joe went on to make multiple other Chuck Norris movies like Invasion USA and, and other things like that but I was not invited back because I couldn't be in another Chuck Norris movie so <laughs> So the last question I have for you um, is, do you have any projects, uh, gigs, or anything else that you would like to promote to our listeners? No. I, I did this, uh, did a couple of episodes. I just, right now I just do stuff with friends, basically. Okay. Um, I did, uh, I don't know, six episodes of the, the, the series Bosch on Amazon because I had friends who were working on that. Okay. I think I have, I think I did six episodes, and I think there's one scene in each of the episodes that I did. So there's six scenes in, in seasons five, four and five, maybe, of Bosch. Okay. Uh, but that was fun. I like Titus, the great guy. We, we had a good time. And and then um, I just did a, another friend of mine called me and said um, he's doing a series for CBS streaming called Interrogation mm-hmm. with uh, Peter Sarsgaard, who I, is just a fucking prince. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and I really enjoyed hanging out with him and, and David Strathairn and, and some people and I just did a couple episodes of that but I I am not I'm not uh, I may go back to the theater someday is really what I want to do which is where I started okay. I, I, I don't really I don't really need need or I don't know it's hard to say you know it's funny that um uh, I saw a reboot. They're rebooting Thirty Something, right? And uh, and I guess they didn't. Uh, and I played a, a character named Billy who uh, married one of the characters in the final season of the original show. And if they were to start with that premise, we would still be married. But I didn't hear from them, and uh, and it didn't really. It was like, yeah, okay, you know, it didn't really make any difference either way. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in my life at this point and uh, I've been writing uh, narrative fiction for like the last 10 years awesome. I have two books out on Amazon that are very kind of dense science uh, future fiction books right uh, one called How Will Be Thy Name one called uh, Thy Kingdom Come and there's a mm-hmm. third book to come which if, if enough people read the first two I will eventually write the third book and then I have mm-hmm. a new novel that I finished that I'm working with an editor in New York right now about a professional golfer uh, who's getting out of prison and he wants to restart his career. Awesome. And uh, and that's, uh, that's hopefully that will be something maybe by next year this time. Awesome. And they and, can get that uh, on Amazon? No, I don't know. We'll see. We'll okay. see how the process goes. I'm working with an editor. I don't have a publishing deal with anybody right now. So, okay. um, I'm just trying to get it, just get get it together, and, and um, I really enjoy doing that. I have an office here in LA, and I uh, I go there every day and work. And uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it, it, I, that is my that's what I like to do. I like to I like to um, you know I think I, th- I think I got it became an actor because I wanted to be a storyteller. Right. And, uh, and, but I was, you're always kind of a little bit, uh, ha- not hampered, but you, you, your responsibility is to be the end user of someone else's st- storytelling. You're finishing their story by portraying it. So. Right. Exactly. And I always wanted to go back to be more of the source in my life. I also have a, a movie that I wrote like 25 years ago a screenplay that I wrote 25 years ago that uh, suddenly I got a call from this producer a couple years ago and he goes, you know, I found this. It was going to get made 25 years ago and it didn't happen. And he said, you know, I, I remember being part of this 25 years ago and now I want to do this. So he's actually trying to get that picture made, which awesome. is really funny. That's yeah. fun. that is I have a, funny. You know, I have multiple movies that I've written that are sitting in a drawer somewhere, but <laughs> I don't think that 
not too many people really care about that stuff. So <laughs> it's just, it's just, you know, I don't know. I've been very lucky. I, I, I consider myself to be the luckiest man alive that I That's awesome. walked away from, you know, uh, a life that I didn't want to a life that I said I would live for 24 hours a day for free. I would be an actor mm-hmm. or a writer for 24 hours a day for free. And I got paid and, uh, and, and got to make a living out of it. And yeah. um, I consider myself to be one of the luckiest people to, to, to get to do what I want to do for the last 45 years of my life. That's so awesome. Well, congratulations on that. You did an amazing job in Friday the 13th. Um, I'm also going to keep an eye out for your books and everything, and and I, I think you're you're an, you're just an talented individual in general. So I think you you definitely had an amazing career and you have an amazing future as well. And I'm very grateful to have this interview. Well, I have many days behind me. I have more days, less days ahead of me than I do behind me. But thank <laughs> you very much, Scotty. You're welcome. Uh, uh, and and good luck to you too, and all and all your endeavors. And and thanks thank you. for for. For taking care of us there and uh not a problem where you, where you do your work and stuff like that not a problem thank you so much and uh, it was an amazing interview and I, it was an honor to have you on, on as a guest and i thank you so much for taking your time you're welcome all right you have a great night and you stay safe you too all right thank you bye bye